Welcome to the third in the series of Personal Tutor Guide to SPSS 19. In this session we'll be looking at the first kind of analysis to be covered in these presentations, in this case descriptive analysis. Uh, descriptive analysis tends to be used either to summarize data or to present it in an accessible fashion using a chart or graph. And occasionally it's used to examine data for qualities like uh, a normal distribution or for trends in the data. If you're watching this presentation as your very first of the presentations that you viewed, you may want to consider the first or second presentations in this series which look at how to use SPSS and how to uh, enter data. However, if you feel like you're already familiar with those functions and are ready to proceed, um, let's go ahead and have a look at how you carry out your descriptive analysis. In this presentation, we're going to be looking at a number of different kind of descriptive analyses. Uh, before we get on to the actual analyses themselves, as usual, I'll be introducing some of the statistical topics you should know before watching this presentation. After that, we'll be going straight into looking at some of the main types of descriptive analysis you're likely to use such as the explore function or the descriptors function itself. And following that, we'll take time to look at all the different kinds of charts and graphs that SPSS can produce to help you summarize and represent your data. Finally, as always, the last step in these presentations is an activity step, and you'll be asked to attempt to recreate some of the descriptive analyses and charts that you've seen us present in other parts of this um, session. So without much further ado, let's talk about what stats you need to know, or stats theory you need to know, before attempting to watch this presentation. As you're no doubt familiar with from the previous presentations where we've made this point, these are not intended as a training materials for, SPA, for statistics. They are a guide to using the SPSS software. As such, there will be certain statistical, theoretical concepts which you'll need to be familiar with if you want to get the most out of these presentations. What we recommend is that you read up on these topics in any good statistics textbook and when you feel you're fairly comfortable with the theory then you're ready to watch the rest of this presentation to see how you put that theory into practice using SPSS. Without much further ado then let's move on to the next step where we'll be considering the first type of statistical analyses as I said on the first slide in this presentation, you tend to use descriptive analysis when you want to either summarize your data or when you want to explore your data and identify certain qualities like whether or not it's normally distributed. When doing this kind of analysis, you tend to use one of three different functions in SPSS, all related to descriptive analysis. And they are either the frequencies function, the explore function, or the descriptors function. Each of these carries out a descriptive analysis but they do it in different ways. Frequencies tends to only count things like the number of times different values appear in a certain variable. Um, Explore is the most wide-ranging. It carries out a very broad range of different kinds of descriptive analysis so it's very good at getting lots of detail on each variable you include. However sometimes Explore can produce too much information on each variable. You don't need to know all of those things about the variable in which case you instead use the descriptors function. This carries out many of the same analyses that the explore function does, except it allows you to be more selective about which analysis you want to carry out on each variable. It reduces the amount of data it produces, which can be helpful if you're analyzing a lot of different variables and don't want to get buried in an avalanche of data. So let's have a look at each of these different um, functions in action and let's see what kind of descriptive information each of them produces. As always, it's helpful to have some hypothetical data to use to illustrate the various functions of SPSS. Here we're going to use some of the same uh, demographic data, or hypothetical demographic data, that we used in one of our previous presentations. So the more sharp-eyed among you may recognize some of this data, and you've seen it before. Um, there are four variables that we're going to be looking at for this particular example. Uh, the gender height in inches, shoe size, that's UK measurements, and distance living from campus in miles for each of these various students. 
And what we're going to do is we're going to um, carry out descriptive analysis on these various variables using the three different functions that I mentioned in the previous slide, namely frequencies, explorer, and descriptors. Here's our data. So let's consider the first of the types of descriptive analysis we're going to use, which is the um, frequencies analysis. Now frequencies you use to count the number of times certain values appear in a variable. Now it doesn't make sense to do this for a variable where there are many many different possible values since you probably may have only each value only appearing once like in distance home. But in a variable like gender where there are a limited number of possible responses it makes sense to say count how many men you've got and how many women you've got. So to do that, you go up to Analyze. You go to the Descriptive Statistics menu. And then you um, look for Frequencies, which is the top option here. And you click on that. And this brings up the Frequencies Analysis window. To analyze any particular variable, you need to move that variable into the correct box. And you'll see that all of the variables are lifted, uh, listed on the left-hand side. But on the right hand side there's a box called variables and if we want any variables to be analyzed we need to move them across into that variables box. To do that you highlight the variable you want to move, in this case we highlight gender by clicking on it, and then you click on the purple arrow in between the two boxes like so, and that will move the variable across from the list of all variables possible to an analyze into the specific variables we're going to look at in this analysis. Uh, to move it back again, you would simply click the purple arrow again, and it moves over and back between the two boxes. Once we've got all the variables we want to analyze in this particular run, moved over, in this case we're only looking in gender, you click on OK. And then what you should see now is an output window. And in this output window, you'll see that the uh, computer is about to show us the frequency values. So if I scroll down a bit, you'll see that the first thing it tells me is the number of valid cases, meaning the number of uh, people who actually gave a response to that question and how many missing pieces of missing data we've got. So everybody gave a response to their gender. So it's 16 people told us what their gender were and uh, nobody has left that blank. So there's no missing data here. Um, if we look below that at the actual sort of frequencies results, you can see that the frequency for males is 5 and the frequency for females is 11. So there are 5 males in the study and 11 females. You'll also see that it'll tell you things like the percentage that each of those represents. So there's roughly 30% of our sample is male and 68% is female. And you can see there's also options for valid and cumulative percent. Those become more relevant later on. For the moment, uh, that is a perfectly adequate introduction to the basic functions of frequency. So, having looked at frequency, let's now look at the next of our three types of descriptive analysis, namely um, Explore. So in this case, I'm going to use Explore to look at um, height and shoe size. So I go back to Analyze again, I go back to Descriptive Statistics, and this time I go to the third option, Explore. I click on that, and it brings up the Explore box. Now, there's a number of different boxes I could move my variables over into now. The main one is the Dependent List box, which is at the top. Any variable I move in here, it'll analyze that variable. So I'm going to move height by clicking on height and then clicking on the purple arrow to move it across. And then I'm going to move shoe size by clicking on shoe size and again clicking on the purple arrow to move it across. So now I have both of those variables in the dependent list. The factor list box would be where I would put a variable that divided my group or my sample up into different groups. So for example, if I wanted to carry out a separate exploration of height and shoe size for the two genders if I didn't want to look at all the genders together. I could move gender over into my factor list and what would happen then is it would do 
a separate explore on height for men and a separate explore on height for women. Uh, an explore on shoe size for men and an explore on shoe size for women separately. However, for this occasion, I don't want to separate the genders. I wanted to carry out one exploration on height for all of the genders and one exploration on shoe size for all of the genders together. Another thing you'll look at is if you click on the statistics ta um, button here in the top right hand corner, you can ask it to carry out certain types of analysis. Now, typically with an explorer, you won't change the analysis it's doing. The main one, which just calls descriptives, is the one you'll be wanting to use almost all the time. The other options are ones that you won't use that frequency frequently, but I'm just showing you that, that they're, they are there. So I'll cancel out of this. Um, I can also ask it to carry out certain plots, meaning certain graphs, and again, um, most of the time you'll leave it just with the basic options that have been selected here, although I'm going to add in that I wanted to carry out a histogram as well, and I want a normality plot. Press continue. And now I'm ready to, care to select OK. And on my output window now, if I scroll down, it's uh, still thinking about it. It'll take a few minutes before it uh, produces all the exploration data. So if I scroll down a bit further now, you can see that the first thing it'll tell me is, again, the number of valid cases and the number of missing pieces of missing data. So there's no missing data here. And then in the main descriptors box, it'll show you each variable separately. So the first variable it shows you is height, and the second variable it shows you is shoe size. And for each variable, it summarizes quite a lot of descriptive information about it. So everything from the mean, the median, the variance, the minimum, maximum, skewness, and kurtosis, it's all here. And it does this separately for each variable. So there is one for a height and then there's a separate set of the same piece of information for shoe size. Below that there are a number of tests of normality which again you would be doing if you wanted to test if your data was normally distributed. And below that again there are some basic charts, there's a histogram and below that a stem and leaf chart. Now we'll be getting into the charts in more detail later on in this presentation so it's enough to know for the moment that those two charts can be produced by carrying out an exploration as well as going through the charts option. Uh, one thing this will show you is that uh, the amount of information that each of these, uh, this simple exploration function produces is quite high. So we've now got box plots, histograms, more stem and leaf. There's an awful lot of information here. And so Explorer is good like that. It produces sort of basically everything you could possibly want and just lets you find the individual bits you want in among all that data. But it can be a little bit intimidating the first time you run that analysis. So that's what the Explore function does. So I'm going to close down this output window just to uh, clear the way. And now I'm going to carry out the third of the three functions, which is the Descriptors function. So again, I'm going back to Analyze, I'm going to Descriptive Statistics, and this time I'm selecting Descriptives. Now, again, there's only one box to move things over like there was for Frequencies. That's the other difference between Descriptives and Explore. Explore allows you to choose a variable to divide up your sample so that you carry out separate explorations on each different uh, group in that variable. Descriptives doesn't, it lumps everybody in together. So I'm going to move over um, distance home and gender into, uh, now you can select both of them together by holding down the shift key, which is what I did there. So you click on the first one, you hold down the shift key and you click on the second one, and now they're both selected. And then I'm clicking on the purple arrow and they both get moved across. So I'm clicking on OK. and. You can see there that the basic option for descriptives is that it tells you the um, number of people who participated or gave you a response in each of those variables. It gives you maximum, minimum, um, the mean, and standard deviation. Now, if I go back again to the uh, 
file and I go back to analyze descriptive statistics and descriptives. Oops. And if I look at the options button here in the top right hand corner, you'll see that I can control exactly what descriptive analyses are being carried out. So maybe if I don't want to know the maximum or minimum, I can deselect those by clicking on the boxes. The little ticks disappear and now when I run the analysis again, you'll see that those particular analyses won't appear. Let's say I want, as well as standard deviation, I want the variance and the range, and I'm also interested in kurtosis. So I click on continue, and I click on OK, and now it's running the same analysis again on the same variables, but if I scroll down a bit, you should be able to see that um, essentially the uh, the information it's providing on the two different runs of the analysis is very different. The first time around it was telling me about maximum and minimum. However, the second time around it's dropped those and instead it's telling me about the range, the mean, the standard deviation, the variance. So this is one of the useful things about the descriptive analysis is that you can tailor it to only tell you those things that you really need to know as opposed to explore where you tend to get the kitchen sink everything in together. And not all of the information that Explore produces can be reproduced in Descriptive. Sometimes some of the things you want to know, you can only find them out through Explore. But it's a matter of finding out which one is appropriate for the kind of analysis you want to do, and then use As well as exploring your data using the um, Descriptive statistics functions like Frequency, Explore, and Descriptives, you can also do it using the Charts and Graphs functions in SPSS. SPSS allows you to generate a large number of charts and graphs. Um, some of them have what you might call a diagnostic function. Their purpose is to allow you to check your data for certain qualities. And other charts and graphs have a sort of display or summary function, allowing you to summarize your data in a, an easily accessible format. Let's start off by looking at the diagnostic charts and graphs. There are three I'd like to look at. They are box plots, error bar charts, and histograms. And each one has a, a different diagnostic function. Box plots allow you to uh, check your, the distribution of a variable looking for outliers. Error bars allow you to compare the qualities of a, a sample against a hypothetical population. And uh, histograms allow you to look at the distribution of your data uh, looking for normality. So we'll be looking at each one of these and uh, how it can help us learn something about uh, a hypothetical set of data. We'll continue to use the same uh, set of hypothetical data as before. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to use the three um, charts I've described there, histogram, error bar, and box plot. And we're going to use each one of them with a different uh, type of data to show you what it can tell us about that data. So the kind of things we're looking for are outliers, um, pieces of data that are very unusual, responses that are very different from all the others. Uh, we're going to compare the sample against the population, because obviously all we have here is a small sample of people, and we want to know if our findings would hold true for the, the larger population out there. And we're also interested in testing for normality, because often many of the statistical tests we use um, are based on assumption that our data is normally distributed. So let's see if that's true for these uh, variables that we're seeing here. So let's see how these things look in action. Let's start off with the first one, which is the um, box plot. Use a box plot to identify outliers, which are responses, individual scores, which are very different from all the others. To do this, you firstly need to click on the graphs menu, which is here at the top. This will bring down an initial option, which is the current way that the SPSS offers you graphs, which is the chart builder. But for any of you who've used a previous version of SPSS, you'll probably be more familiar with the legacy dialogues. So those are the ones I'm going to use today. To select the legacy dialogues option, you move down to legacy dialogues, and there you will now see a menu offering you all the different charts and graphs that SPSS can provide. The one we're looking for now is box plot, so we'll move down the list till we get to the box plot, which is near the bottom, and select it. Now with most um, SPSS graph and chart options, 
it shows you a number of different ways that you can set up the chart and graph. A simple clustered summary of groups of cases, summaries of separate variables. Normally you can leave these at the default option and just simply click define. And there are too many options here for me to show you them all, so I'm going to sort of show you certain functions and leave you to play around with the others in your own time. For this box plot, I'm selecting the default option, which is simple, and the default data option I'm ignoring, which is summaries of groups of cases, and instead I'm selecting summaries of separate variables. Having selected both of those, I now click Define, and I see the um, Define Simple Box Plot menu. Now, normally when you see this for the first time, all of the variables will be here on the left-hand side of the screen, where they normally start off and then you choose which variables you want to analyze by moving them to the right hand side. Um, to select the variables itself you click on it, so in this case you're going to click on distance home and to move it across you click on the purple arrow as usual. The variable you want to analyze should be moved into the boxes represent box over here. Once you've moved the variable across, you're ready to analyze it, you can click on OK. Now, the Results or output screen pops up. First thing it'll tell you is simply the number of valid cases. That just tells you if you've got any missing data. If we scroll down a bit then, the next thing it will show us is the actual box plot itself. Um, the box plot will show you the main box here represented in brown, which shows you where the majority of scores are. It'll show you then two little sort of T-shaped aerials sticking up above and below, which represents the distribution for most of the scores. But if there are any scores where it feels that they are exceptional, far away from the norm, or what we would call an outlier, it'll represent them by drawing a small circle, which you can see here now uh, with number 9 and 15 beside it, or a star in the case of a very far out outlier, which is up here at the top in the case with number 1 beside it. The number beside the variable, or beside the symbol, uh, the circle of star, represents the participant number. So you know that, for example, participant number one, their score is a very exceptional in this case of distance. And if I go back to the data window and I look at participant number one, I can see why that person is turning up as an outlier, where most people, their distance to the university is represented within about 20 miles. This person lives. 300 miles away somehow, not sure how they're commuting to university every day. So that's how a box plot works and that's what it shows you, how it helps you identify outliers. Let's look at the next one which is the um, uh, error bar chart. So with an error bar chart again you go up to graphs and again you go to legacy dialogues and this time you go for the option below box plot which is error bar. This time I'm going to go with the two default options which are simple and summaries for groups of cases. So I click on both of those and then I click on define. Now this time um, it has my variables on the left hand side which we can see and then it has two boxes on the right hand side the variable box and the category axis box. This is a bit like the options we had when we looked at explore where the variable we want to analyze we'll put in the variable box and then if we want to analyze that variable separately for different groups, we put the variable that identifies those groups into the category access box. So the variable we're going to look at is uh, shoe size. So I'll click on shoe size, then I'll click on this purple arrow beside the variable box to move it over there. And the variable I'm going to use to divide people up into groups is gender. So I click on gender, click on the purple arrow to move it over to the category access box. When I've done this, I can now come down here to OK and click on that to run the analysis. When the analysis is carried out, what you should see is uh, the error bar chart here on the right hand side. This shows us the error bars for the two groups separately. So if I scroll down a bit, you may be able to see that this error bar on the left hand side is the error bar for the male scores and this error bar on the right hand side is the error bar for the female scores. Um, the main purpose of an error bar chart is to see if your results would be replicated or hold up for the population as opposed to just the sample you've got here 
and since this shows that the two error bars don't overlap you can be confident that the results would um, hold true for any other sample taken from the same population. Okay, let's look at the third and final option for these diagnostic graphs, which um, is the uh, histogram. So again, we go up to the graphs option. Again, select legacy dialogues, and this time we're looking for the option way down here at the bottom, histogram. Um, again, we have our variables represented on the right-hand side here and we want to select the variable that we want to analyze by moving it over to the variable box and in this case I'm going to choose height click on the purple arrow it gets moved over to the variable box and the other thing I want to select is just below here this tick box for display normal curve this is because I'm going to use this histogram to look for normality in the data and it's helpful if I have a normal curve displayed on the histogram to sort of help me compare what I'm seeing against what it should be I click on OK uh, SPSS thinks about it for a minute and then produces the histogram which we can see here. Um, <clears throat> the histogram represents the distribution of the data and you can compare the actual distribution against a hypothetical normal distribution shown here with the perfect bell curve normal line imposed on the top of the data we're actually seeing. Um, now when analyzing data like this to a certain degree you're using your own judgment about how much the actual distribution matches the hypothetical one but uh, you can also use other measures like skewness and kurtosis to help you with this judgment however that's what a histogram looks like and that's how you produce one as well as being able to carry out diagnostic analyses you can also use charts and graphs to summarize your data and to present it in a very accessible manner. Most people find uh, a table of figures kind of hard to digest but a, a visual image which represents those table, that table of figures in a, in a sort of visual way can often be a lot easier to get your head around and it can be a much more effective way to communicate an idea to your audience. SPSS offers you a number of charts and graphs which can represent your data and represent trends in your data. Uh, the three we're going to look at here are scatter plots, bar charts, and line graphs. Scatter plots are often used when you're trying to represent um, the relationship between two or more variables, which you think is going to be a linear relationship. Bar charts are very effective at representing the difference between two or more groups in terms of a particular score. And line graphs also represent the relationship between two variables, a bit like a scatter plot does, but you'd use a line graph where you think the relationship isn't necessarily going to be a linear one. So let's look at each of these three examples in action. So we're back again now with what must be our very familiar hypothetical demographic data. And um, the three variables we saw before are there, gender, height, shoe size and distance. But we've added a, a fifth variable, interest, which represents the level of interest the student has in the course they're studying. Uh, what we'll now look at is how you can use um, scatter plots, bar charts, and line graphs to represent the relationship between these various variables. Here we are at the data window again. So first thing we need to do is to go up to the graphs menu here at the top, pull that down, go to legacy dialogues, and this time the first of the three graphs we're going to look at is the scatter plot. So we find it down here under scatter dot, select that. Um, again, we're looking for a, a, the default option, which is a simple scatter plot, and we select define. Now, in any scatter plot, there are going to be two variables one which represents the x axis, one which variables the, represents the y axis. To select these variables, we click on the variable and then move it across to the appropriate box. It really doesn't matter which you put as your x and which you put as your y though. So I'm going to look at the relationship between height and shoe size since there's a lot of uh, data from medical studies to show that these two things are connected. So I click on height to select it and then I click on the purple arrow here beside the y-axis box to move it across. I then click on shoe size and click on the purple arrow beside the x-axis box to uh, select to move that across as well. Now there are a number of options I can select but um, 
for this basic example I'm not going to go through any of these you can explore these in your own time so I'm just going to click on continue and I'm going to click on OK to bring up the actual result now if we look here at the output window you'll see that the uh, scatter plot has appeared which is shown here as a square with a lot of individual dots each one of these dots represents an individual person or participant in your study now what you're looking for here is a, a linear trend in the data does it tend to trend in a particular direction upwards or downwards to see that trend represented more clearly what you can do is you can double click on the box itself and it will bring up this uh, chart editor and then you look for the option among these buttons here just above the picture there's one that if you hover over it will say add fit line at total you click on that and it'll sort of offer your properties window which you can ignore you just want the default properties you've now see a line drawn across the data which represents the linear trend in that data you can close the editor window by clicking on the X and now that line is visible in the chart in the output window and that will show you the linear trend in the data if there is one either trending upwards trending downwards or uh, a flat line or a straight up line representing no real trend at all so there you have a scatter plot which in this case is showing that there seems to be a positive relationship between height and shoe size such that people with taller heights also seem to have larger shoe sizes let's look at the second of the uh, three graphs we're going to look at so we select graph legacy dialogue and this time we're going to look at the bar chart which is useful for comparing the score on a single variable in multiple different groups to see if the groups differ on that variable so we're going to leave it with the default options of a simple bar chart and summaries for groups of cases click on define now um, the first thing we need to do is we need to decide what variable are the bars going to represent what score are we going to compare in these different groups well uh, this time we'll look at um, height so we select height now to move height over to the variable box here you'll see the variable box itself is grayed out it's not white there's no option to move it in there that's because at the moment the bars are just going to represent the n of cases the number of cases so it's going to count the number of people in each group but I don't want to do that I want the bars to represent a particular variable so I select this button here other statistics ie the mean and I select the variable I want to use which is height and I click on the purple arrow to move that across now the default option when you do that is that it will now calculate the mean of whatever the variable is in this case height for each of the different groups you can change it to other ver other things you can do by change statistics which allows you to calculate things like the mode or the the maximum value or the variance but for most cases you're going to want to use the mean so I'll leave it on the default option which is mean and click continue but I've now told it which variable I want to measure in each group but I haven't told it what variable identify my groups so to do that I need to select the variable I'm going to use to identify my groups which is gender click on that variable there click on the purple arrow to move it across to category axis and now it'll now create a separate bar for each of the genders and it'll, each bar will represent the mean or average height for that gender I click on OK and I'm now going to look at the output window and in the output window I can see the bars representing the mean height for both men and women if I scroll down a little bit you may be able to see the, uh, the label for each bar so the male bar is on the left the female bar is on the right and if I scroll upwards a bit you'll see that the average height uh, measured in inches is uh, slightly higher for the males than it is for the females um, so not a huge difference here but on average the males are taller so it's a, a very easily accessible way to represent that information the third option I want to look at now is the line graph so again I click on graphs I go to legacy dialogues and I go down to line graph again I'm going to use the default option of a simple graph using summaries of groups of cases and I click on define now again I have my variables here on the left and uh, again it's asking me what I want the line to represent so 
like with the bar chart I can just have a, the default option is to represent the number of people in each group but again I don't want it to be that so I'm going to click on another statistic which is the mean for uh, learning so I'm going to click on learning which represents their interest in learning I move that over to the variable box and then my category axis the thing that's going to identify my different groups is going to be distance home how far away they live from the university so I click on that and I click on the purple arrow here beside category axis to move it over to that box. Once I've done that I can click on OK and if I move it to the variable window or the output window rather I can see my line graph has appeared. Now a line graph will automatically arrange the uh, scores in your category variable in order so it will put them in order from the lowest to the highest so what you should be able to see here is that the um, the distance home in miles is represented from 1 which is the lowest possible score all the way up to 300 which is the highest possible score and then we have the average score for interest in learning for each of these different possible categories and what you may notice here is that the data starts off remaining fairly constant and then takes a sharp dip down as you move further away from the university as their home gets further away it goes down 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 and then it starts to climb back up 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 again as you get even further away until once you get to the furthest distances away the you get up to the higher scores of interest again so there's lots of ways you could interpret that data it could mean for example that the people who are really interested in the course are the ones who are either willing to move close to the university, maybe live on campus or get a flat nearby, or the ones who are willing to commute large distances. So these scores are very high, whereas in the middle here are all the people who live nearby but not very close, and this group isn't particularly interested in their course, so they're not willing to move close to the university, and they're not willing to go to a university that's far away to study that course. So there are examples. As always, we like to finish with some activities so you can practice some of the things you've seen in this presentation and see if you can reproduce the same results yourself. To help you do this, we're presenting you here in this slide with two hypothetical studies which require you to input the data in SPSS and carry out a variety of the uh, descriptive analyses or charts and graphs that you've seen us use. In the first case, we have a researcher who's looking at the impact of practice on, somebody, on the accuracy of basketball players. And the second study, we're looking at a medical researcher who's looking at whether or not there's a relationship between the gene that controls eye colour and the gene that affects people's height. So have a read through these, then pause this recording, input the data in SPSS, carry out the appropriate analyses, and then play the rest of the recording to compare your results with ours to see if you've uh, gotten the same answers. So pause the recording now. Okay, hopefully at this point you've uh, completed your own version of this analysis and it's time to compare what you got with what we got. So let's look at the first of these uh, two exercises that you've been asked to do. In this one you're being asked to look at the scores of basketball players both before and after a practice session and you're being asked for the skewness, kurtosis and histogram for each of the two sets of scores separately, one for before and then separate ones for after. Now, there's two ways you could have gone about doing this. The first would be to go to analyze descriptive statistics and descriptives and that would have allowed you to get the skewness and kurtosis for each of these variables. If you go to options here you'll see there are tick boxes for kurtosis and skewness. Uh, of course you'd have then had to separately get the histograms for each of the two variables and you'd have done that by going to graphs legacy dialogues and histogram and then done this once for before and then done it again for after. But there's one another way to do this where you can do it all together but hopefully you'll get the same answers either way so even if you went about your way of doing this differently from the way I did you should get the same results either way. The way I would have gone about it is to go to analyze descriptive statistics and explore. The reason is that this allows me to uh, get the skewness kurtosis and histogram all in one go. So firstly I select uh, before variable, move it across to the dependent list, select after variable, move it across as well. And the basic explore function will get me skewness and kurtosis without me needing to ask for it specifically. 
but to get the histogram I have to go to plots here on the right hand side and then select this tick box histogram and go continue. Now when I click on OK what I should get if I go to the output window as well firstly it'll tell me the number of valid cases if I've got any missing data which I don't. If I then scroll down to the descriptors box well in the descriptors box I get a separate set of descriptors for both before and then after. In the top of the box here I can see all the scores for before and the skewness score I'm getting is 0.136 which is down near the bottom of the box and the kurtosis score which is almost at the very bottom of that box is minus 0.507. If I then move down to look at the um, scores for after this time I get a skewness of 0.232 and a kurtosis of minus 0.927. Now like I said you could have calculated those using the um, descriptives option and hopefully you'll have gotten the same score. As far as the histograms are concerned, well the first histogram I can see here is for uh, before and however you generated yours it should look something like this. Um, if I was pressed for an answer I'd say it doesn't look very normally distributed. And then moving down the histogram for after should look something like this. So hopefully if whichever way you generate your histogram whether it was through the explore function like I did or using the uh, graphs legacy dialogues option you'll have gotten the same histograms looking something like this. Looks slightly more normally, normally distributed this time but uh, I still wouldn't call it a normal distribution myself. So those are the results you should have got for the, the first activity. What about the second activity? This time we're looking at um, whether or not the gene for eye colour also seems to be the gene that controls height. Now here you're being asked to get three measures of central tendency, the mean, the median and the mode. And also, uh, so you're being asked to get that for the height variable for everybody together, not separately for groups. And then you were also being asked to get error bars, but this time you were being asked to get a separate error bar for each of the three groups, for each of the three eye colour groups, uh, their error bar. So how did you do this? Well, you may have struggled a bit to get the mean, the median and the mode for the height variable. If you used descriptives or explore you'll probably find that descriptives only allows you to get the mean, uh, explore gives you the mean and the median but not the mode. So you may not have been able to find all three. Um, the place to find them all, and well done to you if you located this one, is in descriptive statistics frequencies. Now previously we used the frequency option but we only used it to count the number of people in each group. But uh, if I move height across to the variable box, because that's the box, the variable we want to analyse, you'll see there's a statistics option here as well. If you click on it, you'll see that over on the right hand side it offers you several different measures of central tendency including the mean, the median and the mode. Click on all three of these together, click on continue, and click on OK and what you should get is um, a result which looks something like this. So this is the output from the frequencies analysis. Firstly it tells you the number of people, number of valid cases which is 16, I've got no missing data. And then it gives you the mean, median and mode for that variable. So those are the scores that you would have got. Give yourself uh, you know, a uh, pat on the back if you managed to get all three of them. If you only got two of them, maybe the mean and the median, you did pretty well, but now you know where you can get all three if you want them. So that's the first part of this exercise. What about the second part, the error bars? Well, this is a little bit more along the lines of what you've seen already, so hopefully this won't have presented too many difficulties for you. This time you go to graphs, legacy dialogues, and error bar. You leave it on simple and summaries for groups of cases, click define, you choose height as your variable and you choose eye colour as your category axis, you click on OK and this time you should get an error bar which looks something like this. So you can see the three error bars here, the error bars are overlapping which raises questions about whether or not the results you find for this sample would apply to the entire population. 
Hopefully you've gotten similar answers to the ones I've gotten. If not, you may want to walk back through the steps you took again to see if there's a place where you're doing it differently to mine, or maybe you just enter the data incorrectly and you need to double check your figures. If you feel you've gotten to grips with this, maybe you're ready to move on to your the next of our series. If not, feel free to play this again as